Welcome, everybody, to today's presentation, Moving Your Practice to the Cloud, Best Practices for Painless Migration. Presenting today, we have Pamela Rosa. Pam is a management consultant with over 30 years in the legal industry. She has hands-on experience, experience managing small to medium-sized law firms as a managing director. She is a certified consultant with several cloud-based practice applications. As a strategic accounting advisor, Pam was instrumental in Cosmolex's development to the first fully integrated practice management and accounting cloud-based application. Along with Pam, we have Erica Bursler, the Director of Strategic Communications at Cosmolex. Erica has several years of experience in the legal software industry, catering to the specialized technology needs of small to mid-sized law firms. She has given numerous presentations across the country on legal technologies such as law practice technology management, cloud computing, and legal billing and trust accounting compliance. With that, I will hand the presentation over to Erica. Great, thank you so much. So yes, today's uh, topic is dealing with um, moving your practice from one tool to another and also understanding what comes with that. So to start off, I do want to cover our agenda. First off, why change? Why are firms looking to upgrade the tools that they use to different technology? Also, what to consider when you're researching different tools. The decision to change your setup or the different tools that you're using should not be taken lightly. It's not a small decision. So we'll talk about really what to consider during this process and probably cover a bunch of things that you never thought about. Um, and it's all about the details. You want to make sure that you're making the right uh, choice in that circumstance. And then we get into migration, understanding the full migration picture. So whenever you're changing tools, you do need to think about migrating that data. Uh, some people think, oh, uh, you know, I push a button and everything moves to a new system. Or they say, no, I'll start fresh. I don't need to migrate anything. Is that the case? Uh, what type of information do you need to be looking at and what do you need to educate yourself on? Because at the end of the day, it is your data and it's your process and it's your tools and you need to make sure they're being managed properly. And then we'll summarize with a few tips. Um, really uh, kind of what I was talking about with things that many people don't even consider. And it's great to have Pam as well on the call today because she's done many migration. She's handled taking people from one system to another, dealing with financial and non-financial data. So um, we're very happy to have that hands-on experience on the call today. All right, so our first area is why change? Now, most firms fall into one of two categories. Either you're using a legacy desktop system uh, or a cloud program. And here's a top-level list of challenges that many law firms face when they're in these two types of categories. So we'll start with legacy desktop. What we mean by that is programs that are installed on your computer, data is usually maintained on a server, um, you're dealing with licensing for those particular products. Very common in the legal space, definitely. And there are some challenges with that, at least what we've discovered when dealing with a lot of law firms. First is you're missing cloud benefits, and that could be anything from mobility, you know, being able to access your system wherever you may be, um, but also how your information is backed up. You know, you're still having to deal with that in-house, which takes us to the next point, hardware, server requirements, and maintenance. Um, if you have one of these systems, you're you have a server, you're dealing with maintaining that. You might have maybe an IT person that is keeping that up to date. I have talked with firms where their server's crashed, it has disintegrated, those are the terms I've actually heard from law firms, um, or it's just so old that any day now it could go and they need to really have a disaster recovery plan in place and some firms don't even have that. So that's definitely something to keep in mind and you might all relate to that now, actually. And also, lack of modern functionality. A lot of the new technology that comes about, like client portals, integrating with different tools like office uh, products or credit card processing, um, that's not available in a lot of these older softwares. They're, they have what they have, they keep it going, they support it, but these, what they call cool new functions, which could 
actually give your customer or your client a great experience are not even available, so you don't have those um, options. Then when you're coming from a cloud solution, so it definitely helps with the mobility and the modern functionality. So you do get that access accessibility from anywhere, which is great. You do get uh, the latest and greatest functions and updates, which is good, but you have your own set of challenges and you really need to look closely as to what type of products are in the cloud space. Most notably is these products focus typically on billing and practice management and require a separate accounting program, like maybe QuickBooks or QuickBooks Online or Xero. Does that fit your firm's requirements? Uh, also, you have to think of those tools not being legal specific. So how are you handling your legal accounting and your trust accounting if you're having to use a generic separate software? And the lack of compliance and operational functions. Like, uh, I mean, trust accounting is a prime example of that. How do you make sure you're handling your trust account properly, have the proper reporting, um, even things like fee distribution, calculating income by party, those are functions that are very vital to many firms, but it's a legal specific accounting function. How do you make sure that these tools that are outsourcing that to a generic product will work well for your firm? So those are very common um, challenges that we do here and reasons why many law firms are looking to go to different tools. And a third point is if you're using manual records, there's still a lot of law firms that have either Excel spreadsheets or written ledger books. And for that, you actually have challenges in both of these areas. Your records might be saved on one computer or in one file, not readily accessible, but also it could be very dangerous if that computer crashes. God forbid you have a flood in your office, that could be kind of the end of your records. So you need to be careful about that. Um, you might also be writing information multiple times because though it's your own record, you might have several spreadsheets that you're maintaining and writing this information two, three times. Uh, so you have that added complexity, though manual records are flexible, allows you to do whatever you want, sometimes that's exactly the issue. It can lead to further challenges that way. Uh, and then you're relying on yourself. You're the only person, if you're using something like Excel, you're the only person that can make sure you're being compliant and doing things properly. There's no safeguards in place to ensure that's done. So that's just overall um, what, you know, we've worked with law firms for, I myself, for over eight years now, and this is the most typical uh, feedback we receive as to why many people are looking towards new pro programs. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that what are your firm's needs? Every firm's a little bit different, your requirements are different, and there are generally these categories that um, most needs tend to fall into. And there may be very unique requirements within them for your particular firm. It's not a one-size-fits-all scenario. So for instance, your time in billing. That's like your entries, your invoicing, and your payment. What type of billing methods do you do? Do you do routine billing or do you do as needed? Do you need to worry about um, electronic or leads billing for maybe you're working with insurance companies? The productivity reports that you need. Um, there's several requirements in there that need to be considered. Then you go into business accounting. Uh, that's your firm accounting, your matter costs, your end of year reporting. How are you handling fee allocation? Are you distributing um, or compensating the team based off of the income that they bring into the firm? If so, how is that being calculated? Also, of course, your end of your report. So are you getting the profit and loss the way you need it to be? Are you able to um, report on your general ledger than the way you need to? Then you get to trust accounting. That's specific to retainer handling, your ledger activity, your reconciliation, your reporting. Um, that is kind of a sensitive area because compliance is involved. It's not just about how you want that to be handled, but it, there are state guidelines and federal guidelines as to what's actually required. So you want to make sure you're well educated on what your state, your bar association or ethics committee has as guidelines for trust accounting and that you're following that and the tools that you use help with that um, and make sure to keep you compliant. And then you have a lot of separate activities 
your events and your tasks and your documents, they can be spread out amongst multiple systems, um, kind of just on your calendar, generically, not knowing what cases certain things are for, and it can get very overwhelming, can get very disorganized. But those activities are a key part of what you bill for, but also your main, um, the meat of your cases could be in your documents or your email communication, and it's a very vital part to your case. So you want to make sure of two things, which is what most firms challenge uh, have a challenge with. One is, I mentioned before, a lot of times these functions are in different tools. So you need to think about currently all these different functions, how are you handling them? Are they in different tools? Do those tools play nicely with each other? Are they communicating with each other? Or is it requiring multiple entries that very often can slip through? And also, are your tools legal specific? Now, in some areas, it's, it doesn't matter. Like, for instance, with email or with task tracking. Um, documents, it kind of depends on the type of work that you do. Some of those can be generic functions, but you can't get into generic when you're talking about billing, accounting, and trust accounting. There's a lot of things that are specific to law firms that are required uh, that generic programs cannot do. So those are usually the biggest challenges, uh, especially since all these items, they rely on each other. They communicate quite often with each other. So if they're not working in the right fashion or they're working separately, a lot of things can be done incorrectly. So like I said, think of your current needs, what is and is not being met currently, because changing tools is not a minor process. You do want to make sure that you're making the right decision. And I suggest like this type of image, just look at each area one at a time and see the needs that you have, are they being met and are they being met well? And are there tools out there to do a better job for you? And if you think that you can improve your efficiency, your accuracy, and reduce the time that you're spending on administrative activity, then it may well be worth uh, looking at different tools out there. Now, once you maybe decide, okay, I understand my needs, uh, now I need to choose which technology route to take. Cloud, which is web-based. Uh, a lot of people still, because technology is a little bit slower in the legal community, what is cloud? It's basically being able to access your software through the web, just like you do for your Gmail or Yahoo. You go online, you log in, your information's there, and it's stored on uh, dedicated servers. Desktop, also a legacy is another term I mentioned before, is installed locally on your machine. You're maintaining the hardware, the software, the licensing, the data, uh, and it's all on one computer or however many computers you have licenses for. Now, I'll be honest that most firms, uh, if they're making a change in their technology or their setup, they want something that will scale with the firm and not have to change anytime soon. Because migrating is not a simple thing. Uh, you usually want to do it once and you know, not do it in the near future. Because um, why take up that time for your firm? So for that reason, many do look to cloud products. Uh, because technology in general, it's just naturally moving in that direction. And eventually a lot of these legacy desktop product products will either no longer be around or move in the cloud direction as well. So a couple things to keep in mind when thinking about the technology aspect of it. Accessibility, what are your mobility needs? Do you need to access your software from elsewhere? Um, do you frequently meet with your clients outside of the office? Do you sometimes get emergency calls at night and on the weekends and need to access a client file? Uh, do you attend court a lot and need to be able to pull up your documents directly in court? Varies based on the type of practice you have, but things to consider. Do you like functions like mobile apps? You know, to be able to track your time in the moment, be able to pull up an invoice, be able to make a, an expense entry right there. Is that something that is appealing to you or the rest of the people in the firm? Then you get to modern functionality. Uh, when you're dealing with older or desktop softwares, you don't have modern improvements like I talked about before like client portals, unique integrations, um, new and interesting ways to communicate with your client. Those functions can streamline your practice and maybe produce a better experience for your clients. Uh, don't forget, you're competing with the law firm down the block. Um, 
how do your tools compare to them and does it help you in a, for like a competitive advantage to have some modern functionality. Your budget, what's within your firm's needs? Pricing for these types of solutions are very different. For uh, cloud applications, very often it's an all-inclusive subscription price, either monthly or annual. For uh, desktop or legacy solutions, it is a larger, much larger upfront cost, and then you usually have an annual contract for support and updates and whatnot. Hardware and server maintenance, do you want to maintain an in-house server? You know, maybe right now you have it and you don't want to have it any longer. Or maybe you don't have it right now. You need to consider that if you're going to a legacy software, you will need to have a server, which is not only expensive, but it's time consuming and you need somebody with that knowledge to maintain it for you. And how are you ensuring that hardware is, is stable? You know, uh, is it backed up properly? If you have a server currently, is that being maintained the way it needs to maintain so that it will not just die on you tomorrow? Then you have scalability. Do you plan on growing as a firm? How easy or difficult it is to add another person? Say you hire a person tomorrow and you need to get them all up and running in your system. How simple or complicated is it? Uh, you may need to deal with installations and licensing if you're dealing with a desktop uh, product. For cloud, you log in, you click add, you add a user, it updates your sus subscription and you're done. So if you struggle with that currently, that might be something to think about. And then the last point is data management updates and also backups. So who is managing your data storage and your backups? Are they being done properly? Um, some of you may be using softwares to back up what's on your computer. I know many, many, many firms that say, I have a backup of my data. Where is it? On my computer. Your backup can't be in the same place as your original data because if your computer or your server crashes, then the backup goes with it. So that's not an effective backup. Uh, you need to make sure it's stored elsewhere. When you're using uh, cloud-based applications, there's actually certain requirements in place for how that data is stored, one of which is called redundancy, meaning it needs to be stored in one location and backed up in a different location. So that uh, dual backup um, and it's backed up every several hours depending on uh, the person you're working with that's done for you when you're dealing with a cloud application if you have your own application of course you're gonna have to figure that out yourself and make sure you're doing it properly and one last point in terms of when looking at tools what type of tool is it that you need now billing and accounting especially for um, law firms, they're required to be tightly linked. They rely very heavily on each other um, with costs and income and whatnot, as well as other areas of your business. So believe it or not, the different type of products in the legal industry specific take a few different approaches to this type of situation. Some applications handle both billing and accounting, so that's kind of your all-in-one aspect while others have dedicated programs that focus on a particular area, maybe just billing, and perhaps they integrate with or might not with a program that is just accounting. So you need to think about um, a few or have a few questions when looking at all-in-one programs versus ones that integrate with other things versus those that work completely independently. First is, do you want to manage, uh, monitor and manage the link between those programs manually. You know, if you're syncing things or integrating things, you have to be concerned or at least aware of how those programs function with each other and how, um, what's the term I'm looking for? How sustainable or stable, I should say, how stable those links are, because they can break, they do break. Uh, and you need to make sure that there is uh, a way to rectify those issues if it does break how or who will be in charge of double checking information. You're gonna have double data entry. Who is going to make sure that they all match? A very common scenario is you might have billing and practice management in one system and accounting in a different system. So you may have billing balances as well as trust balances in one system. And then in the other system, you have the same information, but that needs to be processed further, reconciled and, and reported on and, and whatnot. So those numbers have to match. Who's gonna make sure that those numbers do match? 
uh, and that everything is accurate in both areas. Is every system you're using legal specific? You may have uh, legal specific practice management, but you're using a generic accounting system. Is that generic accounting system doing your trust accounting properly or recording your income properly or ensuring that your costs get posted to the matters properly? That's something to really consider because there are legal specific tools out there that can handle that accounting for you uh, and is that generic tool doing it right right now? And lastly is how much is the extra monthly cost if you're purchasing separate programs. If you choose to have three programs to run your law firm, what's the cost of those three programs uh, versus one program? They may be very close, one may be a lot higher, one may be a lot lower, but that, that can't be the only deciding factor, but I would say that along with how well those systems are working for you, that together should be uh, easily pushing you one way or the other. And here's just a uh, quick example. This is actually what we at Cosmlex offer. So this is in the Cosmlex software. And this covers a few items that we discussed. And as you're looking at different tools, as I mentioned, you want to know <clears throat> what your firm's needs are, the type of solutions that are out there, and think about cloud versus desktop, all-in-one versus separate. Those are all decisions for your firm to make. But this is an example of a tool that is all-in-one, billing, accounting, and practice management together. It is cloud-based, so you can access it wherever you are, and it's also legal specific. So that's an example of taking what's most important to your firm and then finding an application that fits those needs. Now, once you've kind of narrowed down the list, you looked at a few possible tools, you have kind of a short list to look at. You do want to test in office to determine the best fit. We always say get hands-on practice, develop first-hand experience, either yourself or if you're in a larger firm, sometimes they deploy one person to do the, all of the evaluating and then involve other people later on. But you do want to get that hands-on experience for yourself. And then lastly, which is what the second half of our uh, webinar today is about is data migration. Once you've decided that, yes, I want to move to a new tool, here's my short list of tools I'm considering, then you want to educate yourself on what is the data migration process and what is my timeline? Uh, how do I plan this out? And you need to plan ahead for migration. You can't just, you know, call a company on December 31st and say, I want everything migrated by January 1st. That's not how it works. So this is a great time of year to really think about um, if you want to make a change, how to go about doing. So that's what we're going to get a little bit uh, more detailed into next. Okay, so migration. We're here to talk about the big picture, what this is all about, and the different things to think through. So migration involves the transition of data from your prior system to your new system. It is not something, as I've said several times, to be taken lightly. Uh, every tool is different, and the type of data that you have can differ from firm to firm. So even if you have a friend who has a law firm and they converted to from product A to product B, and their migration process was excellent or horrible, you can't compare apples to oranges because your setup may be very different, your data and your prior program might be very different. So you want to kind of look within your firm and your own requirements and take it from there. And these are going to be some guidelines. Um, we will have a handout at the end to give you uh, a little bit more detail and expansion on this also. So first point is firm history. Is this a brand new firm? Perhaps um, you're starting a new firm. Uh, brand new, first firm, maybe you just have some contacts that need to move perhaps from Outlook into the new tool, but you really don't have any history. That's probably the simplest form of migration. Are you splitting from an old firm? This is a very common scenario. It's a larger firm. You might be splitting off yourself. Does your data need to be separated out from others? Maybe you're using a program like, let's say, PC Law or something like that at the old firm, and you need your portion taken out. Will you have access to this data or even the server where the data might be located when it comes time to migrate? You want to kind of um, time that along with the physical split from the old firm. If you do a clean break, 
uh, meaning are you carrying over any accounts receivable? Is there assets that are be taken from the old firm? The cleaner the break, the easier it is to migrate, but it does differ based on your relationship with the old firm, the timing, and kind of how that split happens. So it's always worth having a discussion with whoever's working um, at the new product that you're moving to to see how best and what should be moved. Another scenario is partners joining. Perhaps you have uh, two or three firms or two or three solos that are now partnering up. Data might need to come from three different systems or three different accounts in one particular system and merge together. Uh, if you're forming a new brand new firm, you might be able to start from scratch and a lot of information like accounting might not have to be transferred. But it is a situation by situation uh, scenario, but that's just some guidelines to keep in mind. And the last point is if you're a well-established firm, uh, around for many years. I've heard you know, law firms say, I've been around for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. I mean, if, especially if it's a family business, that's very common. What's realistically needed in the new program? How far back does your data go? But how much of that is actually needed in your current system? You might have access to your old system going forward. Maybe some old history can stay there for now, or you might actually have um, printouts and hard copies of this information already. Is it needed to migrate? So that's a couple things to, to keep in mind depending on your firm setup. And Eric, I just want to uh, make a comment. It's very common for your first reaction to be, I want to bring everything with me so I have it all in one place. But if you bring everything with you and what you have is not organized well, um, where there may be some corruption in the data, then you're, what you're bringing over is not usable. So I, I always advise my clients to really consider what it is that they really need to bring. And, and we can't even base it upon years. You know, some people will say, well, you know, I've been in, in practice for 25 years and I want to bring them over my last five years. We really, you really need to give yourselves some, uh, some consideration of what is really vital to, to your practice to continue to put your practice moving forward. And most firms will continue to have access to what, wherever their data was stored prior to the move to the new tool. Yeah, definitely. I know when I, I mean, I have these migration type of discussions with law firms all the time, and it is situational. So you do want to have this type of discussion to see what makes the most sense. But it's true. Most people say, I want all of my information in this new program, just because that's the instinct. They think that's what, what is needed. And it's not always what's needed. You know, you need certain years of information for certain things, but not everything. And there's not just one black of block of data and we'll talk about what your data is made up of both from a non-financial and financial aspect so you can kind of get a, a really tight understanding of what's really needed uh, going forward. The next step is what and how. So it is important to educate yourself on the types of information your firm is storing and think through what's actually needed in the new tool, which we were just talking about. Uh, and that's especially, and Pam made a good point, majority of law firms still have access to their old tool after the fact. I do not suggest 100% relying that that data will be there forever because you could still have your server crash, you could still have your computer die, or whatever the situation may be. So you always want to have still backups and still hard copies of, of certain items, but you'll still have that access for that um, reference purpose because a lot of that past information is purely for reference, um, sometimes with compliance, but not always with uh, certain items. You want to uh, be well aware of the services that are being offered. Once you have narrowed down the short list of possible programs you want to move to, have a discussion with them. Have a migration discussion about what your current setup is, uh, how they, their system works, understand what can and cannot be done, who's responsible for which portions of the migration, and how long it would take, and any associated costs. It differs between every company and 
want to assume if you have a conversation with one company that the same would apply to a different company. You need to have this conversation with any product that you're considering uh, and have a really good understanding. Part of this is just arming yourself with knowing the questions to ask and um, knowing that you need that full understanding with each and every tool you consider of what is what can be migrated, how long that will take, and if there's any associated costs, and who's responsible for what. So we talked about types of data. So I've divided this into two groups, which tends to simplify things. One is non-financial, and the other is financial. And it is important to know which of these you even have. Some, sir, some firms are very simplified and don't even have a lot of this information on a matter level. And where is it currently stored? It could be scattered amongst multiple tools. And if you're gonna have a conversation with any company about migration, you need to have this, um, this information handy because that will help a lot. So matter information, we're talking about names, matter names, file numbers, maybe if you have any custom fields, anything that's vitally important from a you know matter setup perspective, you wanna inquire as to what could move over. Contact information, names, addresses, not just for your clients, but also vendors and other contacts. Your documents, are they stored on your server? Are they in a separate tool? Um, maybe they're in the pr practice management tool you used prior. Do you wish to keep them where they are? Because some firms, they keep their documents on their server and that's where they're gonna stay. It really depends on a firm by firm basis what your policies are, um, but consider that. I, a lot of times I have this conversation and I ask the question about documents and they're like, we haven't even thought about that yet. We didn't really discuss that. So have that discussion. Events, what type of calendar do you have? Um, it might not be in the prior tool that you're getting rid of, maybe using Google or Outlook. Do you want to uh, replace that tool? Or do you want to maybe use that in partnership with a different tool, maybe syncing together? A uh, few options to think about there. Tasks, those are your to-do lists. Um, now with, especially with tasks and events, uh, maybe even with your documents, keep in mind that matter linking is essential. You wanna make sure that all the activities that are done for a particular case are actually related to that case. If you have a uh, to-do list in your old software where everything's linked to particular cases, if that gets migrated over, you wanna make sure that that link is maintained. So that way in the new system, it doesn't just look like a whole bunch of tasks. You know exactly what cases those are for. So anywhere you have matter linking, in your current system or if it's necessary, you wanna make sure that carries over into your new system as well. And then you have notes, um, well actually emails first. You have, that's really any historical client communication. Do you wanna keep it where it is? Do you wanna have copies in the new tool? Uh, a lot of tools have email integrations. You wanna learn how those work because they work differently in different scenarios. And then notes. That's probably one of the most valuable pieces that law firms have aside from documents that they need linked to their cases. I know a lot of people would say, I just wanna know, will my notes come over? And uh, you need to know where they're stored. You need to know if they're linked to the matter, if they're linked to the client, uh, those will get moved over. From a financial perspective, uh, I break this down into three areas. You do have billing information, those you know owed balances that need to get carried over, trust or IOLTA accounts. You can decide, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about historical, but depending on your situation, if you have access to your old program, um, the compliance of your state, you need to decide if you're gonna do historical information here or just go ahead and carry over balances. And then you have your business account, you know, the money that is in the current operating account and what is on the general ledger, which is effectively migrating over your profit and loss and balance sheet uh, for either that particular point in time, if you're in the middle of the month or at the end of the year. Erica, um, I'd like to just uh, insert something here, both on the, for the sure. last slide and for this slide. Um, as you're evaluating what you want to bring over and you're talking to whatever companies you're talking to, understand that what, that they are not going to go through any of your data. 
the most important thing you can do is look at your data and determine um, inactivate matters that, that you're not going to be that you know that are old matters that you that have been inactivated that should have been activated years ago. I mean, I have a uh, did a am going to be doing a a new uh, migration with a firm that actually had eighteen thousand matters that they all consider that were had never that were not that were all active, and we we've taken about six months to get their data cleaned up. And they're now down to under 2,200 active matters. Now, this is a big firm with a lot of attorneys, but bringing over 18,000 matters is just not necessary, especially when certainly uh, close to 16,000 of them weren't even, you know, current matters. So it's important to to look at what you're doing and to understand your own data, and so that you can inactivate, you can condense and you can consolidate different things and also so that you can delete. Uh, one of the questions that typically comes up because of, of conflict searches is my contacts. What do I do with, you know, I have a contact from 30 years ago and I don't know whether or not all the associated family members are still alive. Well, that's a, a, a firm decision, but most frequently it's one of those where you can say, well, you know, I don't need to bring over that contact. Then when we get to the financials, this is really important to be able to really evaluate and understand what needs to come over and the accuracy of the data that you're bringing over. Yeah, definitely. I think with the um, active and inactive, that's a very good point. And it does vary by firm. I mean, if you have a decent data set and the type of work that you do does matter quite a lot. Like in, in some uh, areas of law, you have clients that come back for all different types of things. And in other areas, it's like not so much. I see person once in my lifetime and they don't really come back. Uh, it depends on that type of work. So for conflict checks, definitely keep that in mind if you want active and inactive items to come over. Um, I think also a good point, as I mentioned earlier, if you're coming from a splitting from a larger firm, that data too needs to be clean. You need to make sure that if there's a responsible attorney that it's assigned properly to those cases because that's how a migration works. They're gonna separate those matters and cases out by responsible attorney. If none of that is assigned properly and it's all a jumbled mess, how is anybody gonna know what information to take and what not to take? We can't take all, you know, let's say you came from a five attorney firm, we can't take those five attorneys information and put it into your account. We can only take your information. So definitely something to keep in mind. Um, I'll talk a little bit about historical information, the different areas and when that is most relevant. It is a firm by firm decision, but uh, it's definitely something to talk about, discuss and understand uh, prior to migration. Some extra tips here. So first thing uh, in regards to migration, you wanna keep unique requirements in mind. Um, do you have unique naming conventions for your clients? Um, are there specific fields that you have in your old system that might be custom built that you absolutely need? Make sure your new tool has them and also it can be imported. Just because that functionality is in a new program, don't assume it can be imported or imported easily. You wanna make sure to ask those types of questions. Plan a timeline centered around your cutoff dates. Decide when to stop using the old program and start using the new program. And um, and Pam made a good point. You know, we the firm that she's working with at one point was like, oh, we're ready to go and realize they have all this cleanup to do. So sometimes when you start having these conversations, you realize that the cutoff date you thought would happen might not be very realistic because your data is a lot worse off than you thought. So it's, believe it or not, uh, and this kind of gets to the next point as well, it's kind of like when you're moving from one house to another, like when you're physically moving to a new house. That's a good time to clean up, get rid of the junk, and kind of purge a little bit and make sure you only have what is absolutely needed and that it's the right stuff to have. Same thing when moving from one pro product to another. You want to make sure that you're not carrying that mess with you and that it's not going to resolve it. Going from one tool to another is not going to fix those issues, fix those errors. Um, in Pam's example, 
if those 18,000 matters were moved over, they're all going to be active and they're going to fill up their list and they're going to say, what is all this junk? I don't want it here and have to go through a whole lot of manual work. So best to resolve that prior to migration. Uh, back to the point of cutoff dates. So um, this is definitely, a, and I think even Pam might be able to give a little um, background on this, but this is dependent on time of year, uh, the type of firm you have, the type of billing that you do and whatnot. But let's say the time of year right now, a lot of people choose the cutoff date of end of year, which would be 12-31-17. Keep in mind that non-financial can be done prior. So your clients, your matters, your notes, those types of things can be done prior to that date. Financial, you know, your, your billing information, your trust, your business account, that can't be migrated until after the year is closed or that month is closed. So don't think that maybe it's November uh, 16th right now, there's no way you can get it done by the end of the year. They're two actually very separate processes and they have a very different uh, method depending on who you're working with, who's doing the work and how that's being handled from a timeline perspective. So always have a conversation about, you know what, have in mind the day you want to start using your new program and then develop your plan around that. The history part, so this is what we were getting to before. So full history is not always needed, it's not always best. Um, will your prior system be accessible, like we mentioned before? Uh, know what can be imported into new system. It's not as simple as many people think. I still have so many conversations of those that just think that the new system, which is very different from their old system, all the information will just move over and look exactly the same. And you need to understand that the tools are very different, the fields are very different, the information is displayed very differently. So um, be aware of what can and cannot be moved over and how it would appear in the new program. Do you need things like, we're talking about history, notes, um, tasks, etc. since the beginning of time? 20 year firm, do you need everything since the beginning of time? Uh, or are the records from the old system sufficient? I actually talk with a lot of firms that say, oh, I back up every month or every year and I have hard copies and PDFs of all this information anyway. Okay, well, does it need to go into the new system? Probably not. And think of for your um, certain types of information like clients and matters. For conflict check, like I said, the type of work that you do may depend on that. Do you need all of your actives and inactives? That's a decision for you to make. Um, do you need more than one year of business transactions? Typically, this is most needed for the current tax year. Do you need past that if that's already maintained and your taxes are already filed for those prior, need, uh, prior years? How old is your trust account? Maybe you're a 20-year firm, but you opened a new trust account two years ago. Maybe you just go back to the start of that specific bank account. Do you need a full history in the new system or are your prior reports sufficient? And that does depend on your state compliance. Some states require X amount of years. It can differ from another state. So just keep that in mind when dealing with specifically the trust account. And the last piece, very much important, um, no matter who does the migration, you're responsible for your data and ensuring that everything is verified and approved. Um, in many scenarios, you can hire outside people. You can have uh, bookkeepers, accountants, even migration specialists do this work for you, which a lot of people opt to do because it's something they don't have to deal with. But you need to verify that the information is correct because you're responsible for it at the end of the day. So um, you want to make sure that sometimes companies, like the company that you're working with, will have a checklist for you to sign off on. If they don't have a checklist, you should have your own as to, you know, my number of contacts, did that all move over? My number of matters, did that all move over? Is my naming convention is the way that it needs to be? And there should be an approval process prior to the import. Whoever you're working with should always give you something to sign off on prior to importing it into a system. It's very important to make sure that that information is accurate. And if I can just interject, because I want to emphasize this mm -hmm. point, this is probably the most important part of any migration, is that you verify that your data is correct. It will be exported from your old system. You'll get an opportunity to review it 
and you really need to take that seriously and and verify it. It's because it's the old adage garbage well garbage out garbage in in this situation. Um, you know we talk about checking your contacts. I know because I do this all the time that frequently uh, you'll have payees and somebody and especially if there's more than one hand ent entering the data you will have companies spelled different. I've seen it where it's ATT, AT and T, American Telephone and Telegraph. I mean it's you want to be able to take the time to go through it, to verify it, and to make sure that what you're importing is is good data. Because once it's imported and you started to work on it, it's not something that can be reversed. We don't it, no company, no tool is going to undo an import. So of the whole <laughs> Of this whole webinar, that is probably the most important point for you to take away from this. Whatever you do, you need to make sure that you're verifying your data before you, you have it imported into the new tool. Absolutely. And I've even, I mean, even simplifying it, talking about like clients and matters and that type of information, I have had um, even like our own migration specialists work with clients where they extract the information, they go through it, and they discover discover things like thousands and thousands of duplicates because the old system was not used properly. Instead of them using the same client and opening up a new case, they added another client and another and another. And that's the type of situation where there should be open communication between whoever's migrating the data and whoever was using the prior system because there may be cleanup involved to get all that information where it needs to be prior to importing. So you always want to have a buffer to leave a little bit of time to say, let's just assume that, that the data might not be perfectly clean because usually it's not. Let's assume it's not perfectly clean. Let's leave some time to make sure that all is addressed. And um, being able to have that open communication with whoever is physically migrating your data is very important, especially if you're working with a consultant. Like Pam was saying, she does this type of work all the time. There has to be status updates. Uh, they need to let you know what's done, what's not done. Here's what you need to sign off on. And that whole process, take it you know, seriously and understand that it is your responsibility. You want to be on the right foot in your new system, you don't want to have to be worrying about having a mess and learning how to deal with it in now this brand new system that you were hoping would be you know, a fresh new start for your firm. Okay, and then we're just going to wrap up with a few points um, of what we learned today. We learned how to identify firm needs, what's most important to your firm what to consider with looking at new tools, and also understanding the big picture of data migration. Um, next steps, things to think about going forward. Is your firm in need of a change? Through this webinar, you might discover that your tool is perfectly fine, or there are certain things that may need improvement. Uh, identify what those changes should be, and identify tools which may be a fit and give them a try. That's the first step. You know, get your feet wet, start looking at items, uh, different tools and whatnot, and seeing if they uh, fit your firm's needs. And then lastly is once you get that list narrowed down and you're really committed to moving forward, discuss and plan migration, specifically a timeline to ensure you're transitioning smoothly. A conversation doesn't take a lot of your time. Uh, discuss where your data is, how it's stored, what you want to move over, what's the condition of that information so that you can properly plan how long it's going to take to move that data over. And to go along with today's topic, we do have a white paper available, actually a guide specifically, a free migration guide that you can uh, access in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel. So in the actual panel on the right side of your screen, you'll see a handouts area with a PDF copy of a migration guide, which summarizes a lot of what we talked about today, it gives you a nice physical guide to use um, in the future. So go ahead and download that. You can also access it at the link on the screen right now. appreciate everybody's uh, attending the webinar and thank you also Pam for um, helping us out today with understanding a little bit more about data migration. You're very welcome and a happy Thanksgiving to everybody. <laughs>